So we're going to from Hebrews chapter 3. Therefore, holy brothers, you who share in, heaven, in, a, in a heavenly calling, consider Jesus, the apostle and high priest of our confession, who was faithful to him who appointed him, just as Moses was faithful in all God's house. For Jesus was, uh, has been counted worthy of more glory than Moses, as much more glory as a builder of a house has more honour than the house itself. For every house is built by someone, but the builder of all things is God. Now Moses was faithful in all God's house as a servant to testify of the things that were to be spoken later, but Christ is faithful over God's house as a son. And we are his house, if indeed we hold fast our confidence and our boasting in our hope. Therefore, as the Holy Spirit says, today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion on a day of testing in the wilderness, where your fathers put me to test and saw my works for 40 years. Therefore, I was provoked with that generation and said, They're all, uh, th- sorry, they always go astray in their heart. They have not known my ways. As I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. Take care, brothers, lest there be in any of you an evil, unbelieving heart leading you to fall away from the living God. But exhort one another every day, as long as it is called today, that none of you may be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. For we have come to share in Christ, if indeed we hold our original confidence firm to the end. As it is said, today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your heart as in the rebellion. For who are those who heard and yet rebelled? Was it not those who left Egypt led by Moses? With whom was he provoked for 40 years? Was it not those who sinned, whose bodies fell in the wilderness? And to whom did he swear that they would not enter the rest, but to those who were disobedient? So we see that they were unable to enter because of unbelief. I'd like to introduce Dave, Pastor Dave, up to open this passage to us. So why don't I pray and uh, we'll, we'll get into the Word. Lord, we do thank you for your goodness. We thank you for the fellowship that we share and how important a role membership plays in that. Bless those who are um, sitting around discussing the mission and vision of the church and what membership means. We thank you for... Cobus and Siobhan and pray for their engagement, that it be profitable and holy and uh, bless them. And we think of Matt and Emily with only a few weeks counting now. It's great to see them singing together, and we pray that their life would be a life song together to your glory. Uh, Now, Lord, we come to your word, and we need to know you better. We need to see how you are better, so bless us in that endeavor, in Jesus' name we pray, amen. Well, under George W. Bush, uh, a curious White House conspiracy was uncovered when Secret Service discovered a fake ID of a person of interest. In, in scanning the ID card, they learned that there's a mole in the White House. Why? Well, records of those ID scans revealed dozens of occasions where that person of interest was exiting without entering the White House. Say, what? Uh, That is, there is no record of them entering, even though there were plenty of records of them exiting. See, the mole snuck in the person of interest around the security system. It's too risky Given a mission of conspiracy to be accomplished, it's too risky to go through the normal channels and possibly get stopped. After the mission was accomplished, though, there isn't much at stake to just go out the normal security route. Exiting without entering. Um, It's a fascinating conspiracy. Uh, Exiting without entering. 
exiting without entering is a devastating conspiracy against God, which is what the author of Hebrews highlights in our passage this morning, a passage that relates to God's security system for His people. See, God promises secure rest to genuine believers, but not to believers with fake IDs. Hebrews 3 and 4 is really warning about a more serious sort of exiting without entering than the White House. It's about God's house and people missing out on entering God's rest. You see, the very same generation who exited Egypt did not enter God's rest. Refusing to trust God for His provision of rest, that entire generation of Israel perished in the wilderness between Egypt and the promised land. And we're warned to learn from this. Moses brought God's people out of slavery. He wasn't able to take them in. Joshua took them in. Jesus does both. He's all in one. But not only that, the rest that He brings is a better rest. That's the the title of the message today, and the book of Hebrews, as we've seen, is all about struggling Christians tempted to turn back, and the message is don't turn back because Jesus is better. And what we're going to see, the main idea, every every phrase is important to this of chapters 3 and 4, is this, to enter God's rest, take care to trust and continue to trust in Jesus, God's better rest. Um, The outline for the two chapters is this. uh, Chapter 3 is they refuse to trust God's earthly rest through Moses, mainly in the past. The focus in chapter 4 is mainly now. Us, today, do not fail to trust God for eternal rest in Jesus. Now, chapter 3 is the predicament. Chapter 4 is the promise. I tried really hard to get those together. It's actually one unit from 3.1 to 4.13 is one solid block. I think it was about 8 o'clock last night I realized this is not going to fit. Time to sort of put chapter 4 till next week and change a few things for today. Um, So we're going to get more predicament today. That's just the nature of how things go. Um, But there's still plenty to apply. So let's uh, let's start with chapter 3, refusing to trust God for earthly rest in Moses and the implications for us. Now, now it's no surprise after chapter 2, dealing with angels as God's messengers, that now the author of Hebrews shifts to the preeminent messenger of the Old Testament, that's Moses. Verses 1 to 6 really focus on Jesus and Moses being both compared and contrasted. And there are lots of comparisons that could be made between the two, but the topic of the the first six verses is the faithfulness of those leaders. We see a comparison in verses 1 and 2. Therefore, holy brothers, you who share in a heavenly calling, consider Jesus, the apostle and high priest of our confession, who is faithful to him who appointed him, just as Moses was also faithful in all God's house. Here, the author's quoting Numbers 12, the chapter where Moses sort of sends off the 12 scouts into the land, and they're anticipating entering the land. Uh, Apart from, uh, and it says, my servant Moses, God says, he is faithful in all my house. That's Numbers 12, 7. Now, apart from a few very regrettable circumstances in Moses' life, he was a very faithful servant of God. Uh, He did what God called him to do for the most part. He delivered the Israelites from bondage in Egypt, and he helped the nation form making a covenant with God and the people at Mount Sinai. But the payload comes in the contrasts. Uh, First, we see the creator-creature distinction. For Jesus has been counted worthy of more glory than Moses, just as a builder of a house has more honor than the house itself. For every house is built by someone, and the builder of all things is God. Forget Bob the builder, we have Jesus the builder, 
uh, he's the builder, not Moses. And that, that's the point. We've already seen, remember how the book started in chapter 1, verse 2, Jesus built the universe. In these last days, God has spoken through His Son, through whom He created the world. The craftsman has to get more glory and praise than the craft. He, he made it. And Jesus made Moses. Moses is part of the house, the people of God, the spiritual building. Jesus built the house. Then a second comparison that's made is a son and servant distinction. Uh, Moses was faithful in all God's house as a servant to testify to things that were to be spoken later. But Christ is faithful over God's house as a son. So there's that foreshadowing to something greater than Moses. Remember Jesus, he told that parable of the vineyard where the vineyard owner sent servant after servant into his vineyard, but they were mistreated. And finally he said, I will send my own son and they will treat him rightly. So that a son is better. And in many ways, Jesus is better. And the author needed to point this out so they weren't tempted to turn back to Moses. Jesus is a great, as creator and son, is greater than Moses. And we're going to get in later to chapter 7 and 8 and a different law, a better covenant, that sort of thing. But um, all of the readers would know and remember, they would have known the Sermon on the Mount by this stage, and they would have remembered Moses. He got the law on Mount Sinai, and there were clouds. And Jesus deliberately went up on a mountain and took, took the law of Moses, and he authoritatively unpacked it. And he said, you have heard it was said, but I say to you. He interpreted its meaning by his own authoritative words. And, and Moses prophesied of one in Deuteronomy 18, he said, a prophet from among you, from the brothers, he will come. You must listen to him, somebody greater. And Interestingly enough, on another mountain with clouds, the Mount of Transfiguration, Jesus was with Peter, James, and John. Remember the voice that came? He said, this is my son whom I love. Listen to him. Exactly connecting with what Moses was talking about. Jesus is better than Moses. The original reader's high admiration for Moses assures the impact of this better-than-Moses status being felt. So don't turn back. It's the wrong way. Now, the end of verse 6 transitions with a, a cautionary qualifier. Uh, like Moses, it says, we are his house if we indeed hold fast our confidence and our boasting and our hope in God. Now, we're going to see that very same idea repeated in verse 14 and address it there. But this, this cautionary qualifier is a transition to verses 7 and 19, which is a different contrast. 3, 1 to 6 was about the faithfulness of Jesus and Moses. Now we're looking at the faithlessness that prevents us from entering God's rest. Now, in verses 7 to 11, there's this huge quote from Psalm 95 of King David. And then in verses 12 to 19, the author of Hebrews is going to sort of unpack it a bit, but it's really in chapter 4 he interprets and applies it in the New Covenant. Um, but here's what makes this passage challenging. From chapter 311 to chapter 411, the word rest, as in God's rest, is used 10 times. No, that's fine. But what makes it challenging is realizing the word rest is God's rest is used five ways in the Bible. Here's the, on, along the chronological timeline, the first is found in Genesis, God's rest on the seventh day of creation. Then you move to Exodus, God's Sabbath day rest is a sign back, um, that, but that is for the covenant, the old covenant with Israel. And then you have the promised land as an earthly rest for God's covenant people. That's numbers. It's just going Genesis, Exodus, numbers. Finally, then we jump ahead to rest from our work, trusting in Christ's work because He's our Sabbath. 
and then the full and final rest with God in the new heavens and new earth, paradise regained. Nearly all of those are amongst those, so of those ten, almost all of those are in the mix. So, we're going to try to make this clear, but in, in this chapter, we only see two uses of that, uh, two rests. Now, we're going to handle God's theme of rest, not in the chronological timeline, but as they surface in the passage. And how we can break down chapter 3 is two sections. There's provoking Christ, and then there's partaking of Christ. So, we're going to end with that practical section that the, the author's challenge to us now today. The rest is all about the past and how God was provoked to anger. Now, We've had the whole chapter read, so we'll take some chunks, but it's in this section, verses 11 and 18, that speak of God's rest, and that God was provoked to swear an oath, not the oath you want to hear, by the way, the oath was this, they shall not enter my rest. Which rest of those five is he talking about, and who's the they? Okay, the rest is that earthly rest promised land, variously called Canaan, Israel, Palestine. It's the land that God promised Abraham. Remember when Abraham walked through the land, he said, as you walk around it, I'm going to give that land to you as an inheritance. He promised it. Now, there was a famine in the land, and remember, Israel went to Egypt under Joseph because there was food and store there, stores there. And, um, but then another Pharaoh rose up and enslaved the Israelites until God miraculously delivered them by the ten plagues in the Red Sea through Moses. That's the land as they were delivered from that land to go to the promised land, okay? They, they are that adult generation who was delivered. Now, God brought them out of the land of Egypt with the express purpose to take them into the promised land. He did not want them to exit without entering. That's why Moses said, let my people go. I don't know how many of you, though, know why. If you can fin eight, eight, eight times in the book of Exodus, that phrase is finished, let my people go so that, and that so that, is they may worship and serve me properly, truly. I'm a holy God, and Pharaoh won't let you come to me and serve me with the freedom and the holiness that you actually need to commune with me. So, it's not just rest from an enslaving work in Egypt. It's a call to freedom to worship God in His special presence. And this is how the burden of that promised land comes into play. It was a land described as the 12 scouts were sent ahead, flowing with milk and honey. There's not, there's not waterfalls of, you know, it's not like a, a Cadbury commercial or something. It, it means the land was fertile and abundant for crops and, uh, and livestock. And just one more detail, just as they were poised to enter the land in Deuteronomy, Moses said, when the Lord your God has given you rest from all your enemies... So, you you put this together. What's the picture? The rest is an abundant land in a central place with nothing around you that can harm you, where the people of God can worship and serve Him in His special presence. You should hear echoes of something there, echoes back to the Garden of Eden that Adam and Eve were banished out of because of their sin, but that special place of walking with God rightly. So, the promised land is an earthly step, if you will, back to Eden, back towards paradise regain. It's, it's only an earthly shadow of a greater rest, but it is a good one. So, what went wrong? Verse 8, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion on the day of testing in the wilderness. Now, lots of times in the 40 years they wandered in the wilderness, The people of God grumbled, rebelled, boo-hoo, I'm so hungry, I'm so thirsty, I want to go back to Egypt, back to slavery. Um, You know, we read that and we say it's pathetic, and honestly, we're just like them. 
it's sad, but we, we see things through the same lens at times. But the epic rebellion that caused that 40 years of wilderness wandering, that was when the people had just received God's law from Sinai, and they moved on towards the promised land, and they were stationed at Kadesh Barnea at this oasis. And it's from there that Moses sent out the 12 scouts to recon the area. Now, the 12 came back, one from each tribe, representing the whole of the country, and they were carrying these massive bunches of fruit, and they're like, whoa, the land is amazing. And Joshua and Caleb, two of the 12, said, pack, it, pack your bags, let's go in. But 10 of the 12 said, hey, hey, there's some tall guys in that land. They're hefty guys, and they're warriors. But God had promised this land. The, the God who with your own eyes, you saw deliver you through ten plagues and through the Red Sea, and you're going to let some six-foot-nine types stop you from this glory and return or partial return to Eden? Yeah. They trusted the word of those ten guys over God's promise. And that's why in Deuteronomy 9, 29, this is at the end of the wilderness wandering, Moses said, when the Lord sent you from Kadesh Barnea, he said, Go and take possession of the land I have given you, but you rebelled against the word of the Lord your God. You did not believe Him or obey His voice. That's the heart of this rebellion. That's why Hebrews 3.19 sums it up. So they were unable to enter because of unbelief. The heart of of rebellion. It wasn't just unbelief in general, it was a particular unbelief, not trusting God's promise for rest, for His provision of rest. We'll go about things our way. I think we'll find a safer land, a, a better land, and we'll get in by our own wisdom. Thank you very much. As more echoes of Eden come through, the, the fall in Eden. Now, this sums up the quotation of Psalm 95 from the author. And it's in chapter 4. He's going to interpret most of it and apply it, but that's next time now. Before heading there, the author, though, he does plead with us. And I deliberately skip that because I want to focus on, on this as we sort of head out. And that's now partaking of Christ. Now, he knows that in every, every congregation, the, the author of Hebrews knows, in the congregation he's writing to and in every congregation, including Grace Bible Church and this congregation, the 11 a.m. service, there is going to be a mix of wheat and tares, very similar on the outside, but only the wheat bears fruit, tares or weeds. And, and the author knows that there are genuine believers, and there are fake ID believers, people professing faith, but actually not possessing saving faith. See, unlike the White House conspiracy, where it's a very deliberate, premeditated kind of fake ID, with Christians, we can honestly be deceived about the state of our own soul. And I would be a fool to think that everybody here... Uh, is a genuine Christian. Every congregation has a mix. So the purpose of the author's repeated warnings, this is the first big one, um, is not only to motivate us, keep pressing on in Christ because He's better. It's not only to motivate us, it's also to differentiate us, genuine Christians from fake ID Christians. And his first big warning starts in verse 12. Take care, brothers, he says, lest there be in any of you an evil, unbelieving heart leading you to fall away from the living God. So that's, we're now learning from the past and applying it now to us. This is urgent because he doesn't want us to repeat the mistake that that generation made in Moses' day because the stakes are higher. This is about eternal rest, not just a temporary earthly rest. So, in verse 14, he, prevents, sorry, he presents 
in the book the first defining mark of a genuine Christian, and that is persevering in the faith. That means not turning back from following Jesus, whatever the cost, whatever the doubts, whatever the struggles. Verse 14 is almost a repeat of verse 6, so I'm going to put them up together so you can, you can see them both. We are His house if, indeed, we hold fast our confidence and our boast and hope in Him. We have come to share in Christ if, indeed, we continue in our original confidence firmly to the end. Now, that word confidence, it means it's not just a subjective like, oh, what, what's that a song's in my head from, I have confidence in me, but there's, it's rolling in my head from some musical. It's, it's not that kind of subjective, rubbishy kind of thing. It's an objective confidence. The word means a, a foundation, a substance. So, like, if I was going to do some heavy weights, I, would, I should not have confidence in this foundation, but there's concrete. And our confidence is in Christ, in God. And the word translated hold fast, that, that talks about the stability of a contractual relationship, business, marriage, that is expected to be faithfully held to the end, just like verse 14 speaks. So please hear what this is saying and what it's not saying. And verb tenses are really important here, so I'm, I'm highlighting them. We are right now His house, if indeed we continue. We have come to share in Christ, accomplished already, if we hold fast our confidence to the end. So, what it's not saying is a future tense. Well, I aspire to one day hope that I am in Christ, that I might in the future share in Christ because I continue to the end. You see, then, then it's my continuing that actually accomplished my being in Christ. And that's a works-based righteousness that the Bible just condemns outright. It robs God of His grace. Let, let me see if I can explain this, because that, that, that if it's a future tense, it would be to imply we earn our salvation. M my persevering makes me a Christian. No, it doesn't. It just evidences a true Christian. So, let me give an illustration, because that, that's a bit abstract. <laughs> let's say you're a piece of fruit, right, because that, that happens a lot. But let's say you're an apple. Um, the fruit on an apple tree does not make the tree an apple tree. So, so the apple can't say to the branch or the trunk, you know, hey, uh, I made you an apple tree. <laughs> uh, the branch would be like, I actually think you've got things flipped around. You see, the root gives birth to the fruit, right? Uh, get over yourself, apple. You come out of me. It's because of me that you're an apple. And you go, yeah, that makes sense. So, apples, in this case, are only evidence, proof that it is, in fact, right now, an apple tree. So, an apple can say to a branch or a trunk, hey, branch, trunk, as much as you wish you were an avocado, because they're very expensive when you love to make guacamole, but as much as you wish you were an avocado, I am proof that you are an apple tree. Does that make sense? That the fruit is the proof, it's the evidence, it's not the cause. So, persevering does not save. It doesn't make somebody a Christian. Instead, saving faith is by definition a persevering to the end faith. Now, he makes this quite clear at the end of chapter 10. We are not of those who shrink back and are destroyed, but of those who have faith, persevering faith, not a shrinking back faith, and are saved. Now, lest you think this is just some obscure doctrine that only this guy from the author of Hebrews believes, and I want to give you just a quick 
survey from a whole bunch of other authors from the New Testament. Jesus says the very same thing. If you are truly, or sorry, you are truly my disciples if you continue in my word. Paul says the very same thing. Now God has reconciled you, accomplished by Christ's death to present you holy in his sight without blemish, free from accusation, if you continue in your faith, establish firm, not move from the hope held out in the gospel. There's that hope link from Hebrews 3.6. John says the very same thing, but in reverse, that about not persevering. If they had belonged to us, they would have continued with us. But their departing made it clear that none of them belonged to us. In other words, that permanent departure from God's house, God's people, their failure to persevere in the faith is precisely precise what evidences their disqualification from the title Christian. And that will keep them out of the promised land. Strong words, but clear words. They're so clear, that's why perseverance of the saints is one of the five pillars of Reformed faith. Now, look, we're going to get to chapter 6, but, you know, chapter 6 is to be read in light of the context of chapter 3, because you start at the beginning of a book, don't you? So, we're to read chapter 6 with chapter 3 in mind. And there's one other author, Jude, who does something similar, but he adds this balance to show that Scripture upholds two truths divine enablement to persevere, and human responsibility to persevere, Jude 21, 24. Dear friends, keep yourselves in the love of God, human responsibility. And then the, the couple of verses later, now, to Him, God, who is able to keep you from stumbling and present you blameless in the presence of Him with great joy, divine enablement. Still from both angles, human, divine, and human, persevering and keeping the faith. So, what should this mean for us? Well, well chapter, sorry, chapter 3, verse 12 and 13 speak some words to us. The first one, take care. Take care. Um, how can we help each other in this defining truth of perseverance? Well, uh, there's at least three ways in the first one I can speak, speak of. Is we need to speak this truth in love this truth about needing to finish the race to enter the promised land as evidence that we are truly on the way to the promised land. This is not easy in an era of easy believism, of, of pseudo-gospel where, frankly, you can hear out and about some televangelists or even plenty of waffly, people-pleasing pastors that, hey, you can have Jesus as your life coach, but you don't have to have Him as your Lord. It's cafeteria Christianity, pick and choose what you want. N not at all. This doctrine of persevering in faith and obedience is crucial to the true gospel, to entering God's eternal promised land. Uh, I came across this great quote. I'm going to put some excerpts up. I find this so helpful, and it has the balance uh, of Jude. He says, herein lies the critical distinction between eternal security and perseverance of the saints. Eternal security is the view that there's nothing a genuine believer can do to lose his salvation, to fall away from God's favor. Once saved, always saved. And here's the great statement. While this may be true in itself, it is precarious by itself. So, if perseverance of the saints just disappears you're in a very precarious position to have assurance because it could well be a false assurance. So, this, this uh, writer continues. He says, for the Scriptures also teach there's something every believer in order not to fall away from God's favor will do. He'll persevere in the faith. So, the ultimate cause of a believer's security is found in God, His decree, His salvation. The instrumental means is persevering. So, we need to bring it back. So, when we encounter the New Testament's elaboration on this doctrine, we must not blunt the warnings with false assurance. 
Rather, we should make full use of the warnings as a means of grace so that the Spirit-awakened conscience will examine himself to see whether he is in the faith. Very helpful words. We cannot ignore these warnings. They're meant to provoke us, to motivate true believers to keep going, but to shake and wake people who ought not to have a sense of assurance. Didn't Jesus Himself say that at the judgment, many who called me Lord will not enter? (laughs) They'll be turned away. So, we have no right to give assurance to people who are turning away from Christ. In fact, we should affirm lack of assurance in them so they can be awoken. And in a mix like this, we have people who've just been raised in church, people who are visiting, people who may have come to church so long as, oh, and just being here, entering church doesn't mean you're going to enter the promised land. When eternity is at stake, false assurance is no friend, and friends don't let friends walk in false assurance. We've seen that turning back from Jesus ultimately is rejecting Jesus and His promised land. So, we need to speak this truth of persevering in faith and obedience. We need to speak it in love, and that's not easy, but it's essential. And this can include and sometimes needs to be direct challenges about turning from a sin into which somebody is hardened, but it's more than simply telling. If I could speak as a pastor, it really also needs to be asking the right kinds of open-ended questions. Um, you know, what, what kind of fruit of the Spirit have you seen in your life this year? What victories, spiritual victories, can, can you describe and give God thanks for? Where, where are you struggling? Do you have assurance that you're saved? Why? Why not? Those are the kinds of helpful ways that we can speak the truth in love and not just say, hey man, turn or burn. Not easy, but I tell you what, for our vitality as a people of God, all wanting to enter His rest, essential. Secondly, as we get to verse 13, there's this inviting beside, this coming alongside ministry that that goes well with speaking the truth in love. Um, It's here the author gives a second plea, one with a bit more more positive form, although this is still a predicament chapter, but exhort or encourage one another every day, as long as it's called today, because as long as it's called today, you got a chance, right? So that none of you may be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. Now, that verb, exhort or encourage, is very special. It's the very same word Jesus used of the Holy Spirit when He said, I must go to the Father, but I will ask the Father, and He will send to you another, and depending on your translation, another comforter, another helper, another counselor. That's the Holy Spirit. So, to encourage one another is to be an instrument of the great encourager, the great counselor, the Spirit. And the verb literally means to invite beside. That, that's what that, that verb, uh, comforter, counselor, um, to, to invite beside, to come alongside someone. Uh, the verb's often translated counsel, help, challenge, exhort, comfort, but always on their side, right? always on their team beside them, never against them. The same verb is found in Hebrews 10, that famous verse, let us consider how we can spur one another on to love and good deeds, not giving up meeting together, because we need this one another, this alongside ministry, as some are in the habit of doing, giving up, you know, um, but encouraging one another all the more as you see the day drawing near. That's, that's a couple of times this Invite beside ministry is what we need, and we do really need it. Recently, I was chatting with a brother who, for the past couple of years, have been a real spiritual struggle. And in chatting, he's been in, in no home group, no small group, no discipleship group, no, no small face-to-face refining and he's feeling the downhill slide. 
And maybe you're feeling it too. And that, that's what happens. We need the alongsideness beyond the big Sunday. I mean, um, big Sunday is crucial to, to sing together, to pray together, to remember the Lord's Supper, to hear sermons, that sort of thing. The pulpit is essential, but, but it's not sufficient. So the question is, what sort of regular, meaningful, small group or one-on-one -on -one alongside ministry are you engaged in where people can personally help, comfort, counsel, exhort, pray with you, follow up with you in an ongoing way that you don't get usually over a, a chat after church and a quick cup of coffee? And if the answer is, I'm not in any, well, the next obvious question is, well, which one are you going to enter into and join and become part of? How many times, see, have you been convicted by something in big church? A worship leader may have said something, a, something in a prayer, something in a communion meditation, something from a sermon. Ooh, and there's this burden, this conviction that you know you need to follow up on, but there's not a brother or sister who knows about that burden, that conviction you have that comes alongside and says, hey, let's pray. Hey, let's follow up. Hey, I'll hold you accountable. I'll encourage you. I'll come alongside you. And by the way, a good come alongside minister, whether they're a friend, a mentor, a home group member, a shepherd, whatever, a good come alongside minister humbly shares their struggles too, confesses their weaknesses, because that's the nature of being side by side on, on the same team, pressing on in Christ encouraging one another. Without a come-alongside ministry, it's too easy for us just to quench the Holy Spirit who says, today, if you hear His voice, do not harden your hearts as they did in the rebellion. My plea is, get involved in people's lives. Check the bulletin for times and locations of home groups, women's growth groups, Authentic manhood, youth groups, smaller discipleship groups that will be ramping up uh, in term three. So important. And that's the burden of verse 13. And finally, this might sound trivial, but it's not at all. We need to see examples of perseverance. Um, Hebrews 11, that great hall of faith, it's down the trackways, but man, just reading, reading the history of God's people their joy and salvation and persevering, the, the joy of having property confiscated for Jesus. You're like, whoa, that's amazing. And a couple of verses just from about Moses, because, you know, this started with Moses. By faith, Moses, when he had grown up, he refused to be known as the son of Pharaoh's daughter. Instead, he chose to be mistreated along with, alongside the people of God, rather than enjoy the fleeting pleasures of sin, because he regarded disgrace for the sake of Christ as of greater value than the treasures of Egypt, because he was looking ahead to his reward, which is a heavenly city, eternal rest with God. My spirit, just in hearing that cost-counting, that Christ-prizing example, it's stirred up. And I got a lot of comments about the video I showed last week with that Egyptian widow and the way that she shared forgiveness, but also hope in her reward. But Moses, his story is written. We can't interact with that precious widow from Egypt or other people on the internet. We need to see one another persevering in the faith with joy and saying, Jesus is worth it. Especially you seasoned saints, you older saints, we need to see you finish strong <laughs> so that we can go, yes, I can do the same, I must do the same. So please press on in Christ. Share your journeys with others. Don't sugarcoat it. The Bible doesn't sugarcoat stuff, but share how you've persevered, how you What's motivated you to overcome challenges? What treasures of Egypt or Brisbane or Hollywood did you once stumble on, and came, but you found the value of Christ worth moving from those things? I've got to say, younger people, too, 
maybe especially younger people with growing trials at schools and worldviews and sexuality and exposure on the internet. You need to persevere. Perseverance begins at any age that you come to Christ. We need each other. See, when we're discouraged or persecuted, the, the comfort of knowing Jesus is the builder of his church and the gates of hell will not prevail the church he builds, but it's greater comfort to see that prevailing here in each other, isn't it? I need to see it. Sometimes when I feel like throwing in the towel of ministry, or if I just am struggling with hard-heartedness of a particular sin or just general sin and lethargy, I cannot tell you what a motivator it is when I see you guys counting the cost and following Christ. I see the way some of you encourage people in their faith in chats after service, redeeming those conversations, the way you use your homes as spiritual training stations for home groups, discipleship, just have people over for meals after church and speak into their lives and encourage them. I hear about those things, and I see those things, and you know what? Sometimes, honestly, it puts me to shame, and I love that. And I need that when other people are pressing on. I love you guys for persevering and loving the Lord, and we need to see the example in one another. So next week is chapter 4, exposing our lives meaningfully to God's Word, that famous 412, the living Word. But chapter 3 has been exposing our lives meaningfully to God's people. I've got to share one verse from chapter 4. Therefore, the promise of entering God's rest still stands. There's the promise. It still stands. We'll hear next week how Jesus brings it. But he brings a better rest. And he himself says, come to me, all who, you are, all who are weary and burdened, and that might be you, I will give you rest, rest for your souls. So hear this. There is no sneaking around White House conspiracy method to entering God's rest. There's no going around Jesus. He's the only way in. He said, truly I say to you, I am the gate of the sheep. I am the gate. Whoever enters in through me will be saved, and they will find pasture, rest. The promise of entering his rest still stands. Praise God. And if you don't know that rest, today, while it's today, do not harden your hearts. Come to Christ. Consider Christ. As the musicians come up, let's pray. Lord, we thank you for your faithfulness in Jesus, which we'll see much more of next week. And I thank you for your faithfulness in your spirit at work in your genuine children. Oh God, may we exhort and encourage one another while it's today. Chisel away what is not Christ in us as we walk with you together. And now may we sing with the phrase from the verse we started with, consider Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen.